So welcome back to the second part of the lecture. We will now talk about feature under programming and uh, feature modules. So this name already suggests that this is there's some connection to features and to product lines. And it is, it is we will talk about feature under programming in this part and aspect under programming in the other part. And these are the two techniques that we discuss in this course that mainly focus on how to modularize cross-cutting concerns. So the motivation is we can think of our system as something where features are somewhere entangled uh, in the whole system and we want to provide a modular implementation of every feature and be able to compose the system, to compose the feature with the system uh, on demand. And why we are doing this, one of the things uh, we are doing this is feature traceability. We want to easily find all the source code, all the artifacts for a certain feature. And we not only want to find this in a certain product, but also in our product line. And in terms of existing techniques, we want to uh, achieve two things that haven't been possible with existing techniques as uh, uh, highlighted in the first part of this lecture. We want to have a flexible extension. We want to be able to provide new features, also those features that haven't been envisioned before. So for which no, uh, so not certain interfaces or extension points need to be made available in, in, uh, in uh, previously uh, from the system. Uh, because we want to have minimal pre-planning. So I'm not saying here that minimal pre-planning is a good thing, but the problem is that whenever we have a technique that requires extensive pre-planning, then it means that we will always miss something, right? So we want to have something more agile here. We want to have something that also allows us to uh, implement some extensions that have not been envisioned by means of extension points and interfaces. So achieving all this requires novel implementation techniques that overcome the limitations of classical object-oriented paradigms, uh, but also the limits of existing techniques like components, services, or frameworks. So the background about uh, feature under programming is that of collaboration-based design, and it's inspired by collaborations in the real world. So people collaborate to achieve a common goal. So for instance, Timo Kehrer, Elias, and I, uh, we collaborated on this course uh, to provide these slides and provide content about product lines uh, for you. So a collaboration typically comprises several persons playing different roles. So for instance, in terms of this lecture, Timo Kehrer provided the first uh, lecture and Elias and I uh, have had discussions uh, with Timo in advance and also uh, feedback on later drafts. And then we also revised the slides um, uh, uh, later on. So everyone has different roles and persons may play multiple roles participating in different collaborations. So we have several lectures and sometimes uh, I will be the, the first creator of the slides and other in other collaborations I will be uh, the, the one that revises. Um, there's another example here that of students and mentors and the person in the role of a mentor has the responsibility to instruct students on certain topics, also to motivate them. And a person in the role of a student has the responsibility to, to study the offered uh, material um, and to uh, kind of make themselves uh, familiar with the provided topics. So what are collaborations in Java? A collaboration is a set of interacting classes, each class playing a distinct role to achieve a certain uh, function or capability. And of course, in, in the practical way, if the system runs, then this can also mean that objects are actually interacting with each other. It doesn't need to be uh, always something uh, statically on the level of classes. A role defines the responsibilities a class takes in a collaboration. So we kind of have the system that uh, that uh, is as that a class can 
uh, can be in multiple collaborations and it takes different roles in those. So we have different classes that play different roles within a collaboration. We have a class that plays different roles in different collaborations, but we also have that a role encapsulates the behavior, the functionality of a class relevant to a collaboration. If you cannot follow this for now, don't worry, we will have examples, a lot of examples in the later parts. And the examples will be based on our graph implementation. So we will look at the graph implementation and we basically have two dimensions here. We have the first, the dimension of classes. We have the classes graph, edge, node, weight, and color. And those classes collaborate with each other in certain collaborations. And the collaborations in this example are base, which is a base implementation of the graph library. We have the collaboration directed, where certain classes are involved. In this example, the classes graph and edge. We have weighted, where also graph and edge are involved because we are talking about weighted edges and directed edges here in the collaboration. Uh, but sometimes some new classes appear. So in this example, the feature uh, weight is introduced. And we also see that not every collaboration extends our graph class and has, has to do or needs to uh, an interaction with the graph class. Uh, because for the colored nodes, for instance, we might be able to implement this by means of an interaction of the classes node and color only. So the idea of feature modules and feature module composition is that each collaboration is mapped to a feature and this is then called a feature module. So while collaboration-based design uh, is a bit more like a philosophy of uh, developing systems and uh, rather provides ideas, feature modules are more, um, as you will see in a minute, are more concrete, are an instance of collaboration-based design, and they make certain uh, language extensions and provide us means to implement collaboration-based designs. So feature modules may refine a base implementation by adding new elements, like new classes, for instance, the weight, um, the weight class uh, in the collaboration weighted or extend existing ones as we can see over here the node class is extended by means of the collaboration colored and what happens then is at some point in time we want to compose our system we want to compose those collaborations together and the result will be then be um, a directed graph in this example, if I would choose the feature or the collaboration space and directed. And what I need in order to compose those fragments of classes is what is known as feature module composition. So we already see that um, uh, on the slide, there's also a different term used, uh, and this is the term layer. So basically layer is just another term for a feature module or for collaboration. And uh, the reason is that when we draw classes in columns, then a layer is basically uh, just a row in such a, a tabular uh, form. So now we have open questions. So how to bundle classes to feature models uh, and specify the refinements and how to handle refinements during composition of feature modules. So these are two central questions. One is on the left part of this picture, right? So we, how do we yeah, decompose uh, a single class onto multiple parts? How do we identify which roles are actually uh, within the same collaboration, but also how to compose them. Once I made my selection, my choice, what are the collaborations, the features, the layers that I need, how can we uh, compose them together? And we will see this uh, in terms of practical examples, and we will use um, the yeah, kind of the canonical implementation of feature under programming, which was made available by Don Batory and others um, in terms of the AHEAD tool suite. And this tool suite basically provides uh, yeah, different uh, options. We will first look at the high level view. We have different layers or collaborations or feature modules, and these layers are then composed into an application. 
So the keyword layer is, uh, will then be used on the next slides to indicate if we define a certain class, what is the layer that it uh, belongs to? And this is similar to a package, but we will see in a minute uh, what is different here. Then we have class refinement, and class refinements are indicated by the keyword uh, refines. And those refinements can add new members to a class and extend existing methods, and we will see this in a minute. And the basic principle that we will uh, that we will use in this example, so the ahead way of programming things is that there's a special new format to identify to write Java code. It's um, uh, Jack, uh, short for Jakarta, and these new this new uh, extension, this extension of object on programming with Java for feature orientation with these additional keywords like layer and refines. Uh, this is uh, then combined by means of one of two techniques. We will talk about them later into a composed form. And this is then translated by means of a tool into an actual Java program, uh, into an actual Java class. And we'll do this, we will do the same for different Java classes and JAK files. So we have these JAK layers, and this, this is what is indicated on the, the top. We will first look at how does a layer look like, and a layer looks like, uh, in, in this case, at least uh, like a regular Java program. So we have three files over here. We have graph.jak, node.jak, and edge.jak, and these three classes are basically um, yeah, uh, uh, simple Java classes. And they together provide the functionality, the collaboration base implementation of the graph. And then the question is, how does this class refinement work? Right. So this is the central element of feature on the programming of feature modules is that of class refinement. And how does it work? Um, so let's first look at the example. So we have a base implementation uh, over here, and then we refine this implementation, and then we refine it further. And whenever we re refine it, we can introduce some new members to this existing class. So we can provide new, new fields, as in this case, but we can also provide new methods and other members. And then this gives us kind of an refinement chain. So we see that this is a refinement chain. And we can also see this in uh, the smaller picture over here when it comes to that there are several classes in the system, several classes composed. And this refinement chain is basically given by a base implementation of the class and then several refinements. And of course, this refinement is, um, is in, in some sense, um, dependent on the, con on the collaborations that we're interested in. So when removing a certain collaboration here, then the refinement chain will actually be a different one. So then we can look at um, class refinement in terms of method extensions. So because simply introducing new fields, introducing new methods, in most cases, in terms of some exception, except some cases with reflection and so on, uh, this will typically not change uh, or alter the behavior uh, of the system in an intended way. It will only provide us a slower implementation. But uh, for instance, in our example, we want to uh, extend the print method. And what we can do here is the following. We, in a, a refined class, we can provide another version of the print method. So this print method has the same name as the print method up here. And we can uh, implement some new functionality here. So in this case, it's just a simple uh, uh, yeah, uh, print out on command line. But we can also access the previous implementation. So the previous implementation will be uh, uh, by means of this keyword, uh, it's the keyword super with a large uh, a capital S. And um, this is then uh, later on uh, refined to something that 
uh, calls the base implementation. And we we'll see that this comes again and this what what makes the refinement hierarchy. So we are calling again something and adding some additional functionality in terms of the layer color. So uh, we can overwrite methods and that's very similar to object orientation. Uh, you uh, might uh, accept for the super with a large S and the refines keyword uh, and uh, we would, for an inheritance hierarchy, we would rather have the extends keyword to say, what is the uh, extended class? The interesting part here, and this is how this, uh, why this uh, even works, um, and is more flexible than uh, object-oriented inheritance, is that if I say, I don't need this collaboration, then this arrow would actually go over here. And this is something that is not feasible by means of classical inheritance. In inheritance, you will always provide the superclass and you will always have the same superclass. And the refinement chain in feature modules and feature under programming, this is dependent on the selection of features, the selection of and their according collaborations and implementations. So now the basic question is, we had two questions. One question was how to define those collaborations and the other one, how to compose collaborations. So now we will look at the second question, how to compose collaborations. And one tool uh, that can be used in a head is JAMPEG. JAMPEG superimposes the refinement uh, chain into a single class and a single class will look like this. We will only have one instance of the print method and it will basically contain all the content uh, from the different collaborations. And this is actually very similar to what is known as method inlining in compiler construction, which is also an optimization technique in compiler construction uh, in order to avoid some of the method calls. And what happens here is actually very similar. But there's another way, how can we express this? How can we compose different classes? And um, what is, uh, uh, and this is known as Mixin in the ahead tool suite. So Mixins retains a layer relationship as an inheritance chain. So all those layers will still be visible. We will see that this comes from the layer base and this comes from the layer directed. And it's not that easy to see, but this obviously comes from another layer. In this case, the layer weighted. So in order to make a distinction between those, uh, we create a hierarchy and we need to define some new names, right? So in order to be able to create this inheritance hierarchy, uh, we create some new names in here and we see that um, every name except the last class refinement is renamed in this case um, with two dollar signs. And the reason is that dollar signs are uh, not recommended in uh, class names anyway because they are already used for subclasses but for subclasses a single dollar sign is used so the idea of those dollar signs is to avoid accidental name clashes so how does it work so the mixin uh, basically produces a single file but the single file contains an linear inheritance hierarchy and um, only the bottommost class is the public version, the one that is actually supposed to be accessed from the base implementation. And imagine you, we have a larger implementation, then edges mentioned everywhere and new edges are uh, instantiated. And by means of this special renaming, we make sure that the last class refinement is used in the base implementation and then all these uh, possible and few, uh, previous extensions are then uh, called by means of um, yeah uh, just pure object-oriented inheritance. And then we translate the keyword super with a capital S into a super with a small s. And we see that this basically calls the existing methods over here.
so just a side remark uh, for those of you that are more familiar with programming languages and you might have used Haskell before and heard of Mixins. So Mixins are actually uh, something rather different like uh, than what we have here with Mixin. So Mixin without an S is the concept that I explained here, which is used in the AHEAD tool suite. And Mixins are a language concept to decompose classes into parts without the use of inheritance. So this is very similar to JAMPACK. So we can define something in different parts, but overall at runtime, it will be a composed class, a class composed into one um, system. So what to use? Now we have two options uh, to compose feature modules, collaborations. We have Jampack and Mixin. In Jampack, assignments of generated code to role disappears after generation. So we, we will not see the roles immediately. We will not be able to easily uh, find out where does the code come from. And something uh, subtle that we need to keep in mind is that depending on the, the how the tool does the implementation and the method inlining, it, it might be feasible that local variables can be accessed from refined methods. And this is something to keep in mind. With Mixin, uh, we have some code overhead by means of those uh, inheritance hierarchy, by means of those classes. Um, I mean, we always have uh, some overhead by means of object orientation when it comes to subclasses, but here, we are about to expect many more uh, of those subclasses and those subclasses are generated automatically of those roles that we find in collaborations. So it's likely that it negatively impacts the runtime. It depends a bit on the system, how much this will be. And the feature modularity for mixes is preserved even after composition. So I can recognize where, uh, for which feature this implementation was implemented. So what is our recommendation in practice? Uh, you might want to use Mixin uh, for debugging, but then Jampack for a production system where performance matters more. And you can use Unmixin uh, during debugging to also change something in the generated file, the generated file that is seen by the debugger, but then propagate those changes back. So uh, <clears throat> once we generate it, a jug file in terms of mixin, and you've seen this on a previous picture, we can actually start a debugger, we can change this code over here, and then we can propagate those changes back by means of unmixin. And this is not so easy with Jampack because with Jampack, the connection where the features, where the code came from is not that easy to access anymore. When composing feature modules, we need to consider the order. Um, the order was not so relevant in the previous techniques that we looked at, but over here, we will see that a certain composition order will um, lead to a different result. So the class refinements that we see on the left-hand side are rather independent of each other, and we can implement them without uh, thinking of the order in many cases. But still, when composing them in a certain way, in a certain order, we might have dif different results. For instance, if we look at uh, the connection or the order ABC, then we will have the following result. And this actually changes if we change the order. So in this case, it's only the order in which the system out print line uh, statements are uh, specified. But uh, of course, in practice, you can have completely different behavior, uh, even unwanted behavior. So where does the order come from? Basically, the order is an input parameter to the composition tool, for instance, ahead. And with Feature ID, we are providing uh, tool support in Eclipse for ahead uh, and also for another tool that I will mention in a minute. And in Feature ID, the idea is that you can find a total order uh, based on the feature model, or you can provide your own order. And how this works is we, the default order will always be the order by traversing the feature model and we are traversing the feature model in the following way.
And by following this path, we are collecting all the concrete features over here, and those concrete features are then given, uh, are then specifying the order in which feature modules are composed. And in some positions, you might want to change that shortest path is actually uh, implemented over here for whatever reason, and then uh, you can specify your own uh, order. So what is the big picture uh, of feature-owned programming, of implementing uh, product lines with feature-owned programming? We have some feature module and we have a one-to-one -one correspondence to collaborations in the source code. And here it makes sense. Uh, we've used several synonyms in the lecture. We've used feature, layer, feature module, collaboration. And while feature module, collaboration and layer are always terms that refer to the implementation. Uh, we have the features in problem space defined in the feature model, and those features are then implemented in terms of feature modules. Then we make a certain selection of our features. This automatically gives us which collaborations are needed. Those collaborations are selected and composed and compiled to build the final product. So the practical organization of feature modules is uh, how do we find those parts that uh, belong together in terms of a feature module. And what is common is to provide folders and a folder for every feature module. And in this folder, you provide all the uh, necessary parts. So uh, uh, that's when uh, there was some evolution also in the head tool suite. So the keyword layer is not needed anymore because uh, the keyword layer was actually uh, inserted somewhere at the beginning of the file, similar like package, um, but it's not needed anymore because the layer is actually uh, found by means of the folder structure. So uh, a short, um, some short remarks also about uniformity. We have software that not only consists of Java source code, we might have other programming languages. We have build scripts. We have test code. We have documentation. We have some models. We have UML models, for instance. And all these different artifacts need to be refined, right? If I think of a collaboration, it can be that in the collaboration, in one collaboration, there's a basic implementation, a basic uh, build scripts defined, and those are then extended. Those models are then extended in other parts. And yeah, the idea is that we can provide a uniform way of uh, representing these feature modules, representing these collaborations, uh, by means of saying that the directory may not only contain Java code or these JAC files in terms of a head, but it may provide any artifacts, and these artifacts are composed to each other. But of course, this is a bit dependent of the language that we are using. So if you look at this example over here, we have two features, A and B. And these features, A and B, provide some code in a certain folder, but they also provide some, uh, some HTML documentation. And what we do over here is we basically create, uh, we can compose not only uh, we kind of we superimpose the folders, which means we overlay those folders. And whenever we have found something that is in the same hierarchy with the same name, then we combine those. So we see this in terms of the x.jug because it's always in the folder code. And when it comes to, to other files, we would do the same. Uh, so for HTML files, uh, we could think of extending something at the end or doing some some more uh, fine granular superimposition. And of course, this depends a bit on the language. <clears throat> and uh, there's actually an, a newer tool um, for feature under programming than the AHEAD tool suite. It's called Feature House. And the idea there was to build language independent models to implement features in a language independent fashion. And then we have a, a common structure, these feature structure trees, which are basically a representation. Uh, if you know compiler construction, then you might have heard of abstract syntax tree. So this is very similar to that uh, idea. And then we compose 
these different feature structure trees, so we parse them to some extent, we compose them, and then we uh, later on pretty print them, and uh, this is what the overall infrastructure looks like. We can specify certain languages. Then we have a generator, and this generator kind of uh, yeah generates uh, a certain pipeline that we can use. Uh, we will have a parser that parses our source code or the other uh, artifacts. Uh, then we have a composer that helps us to combine different artifacts, different collaborations. And then we have a pretty printer because in many cases, we also want to look at the source code later on and humans want to debug the code. So we have a pretty printer over here. And the interesting part is that while we have different languages over here and they all look quite different, there's actually a library of composition rules and these composition rules are shared among different languages. So basically we have for Java code, we have a parser can create these feature structure trees and then we have a pretty printer and it produces pure Java code. And we have the same for C Sharp, C, Haskell and other languages. So what is different? Um, uh, the syntax looks a bit different. So the keyword is not uh, called uh, super with a capital S, but it's rather called original. There's no refines keyword over here. So original is basically the only additional keyword that Feature House provides to existing languages. And it's designed in a way that it looks for most of the tools uh, as a simple method call and just the method cannot be recognized because there's no method called original. And this will then be replaced by means of a method call in uh, the composition. So we talked about feature modules and I want to discuss the advantages of feature modules or feature in the programming to implement software product lines. We have easy to use language-based mechanisms. We have minimal language extensions, for instance, Feature House only has one additional keyword and we can still use syntax highlighting and so on from existing tools if we can live with the fact that the keyword original is not highlighted. Conceptually, uh, this can be applied uniformly to code and non-code artifacts to different languages. Uh, we have a separation of feature code into distinct mo feature modules um, and we can combine everything that is um, yeah, building the implementation altogether of a feature into one module. We have little pre-planning required to do those mix and based extension mechanism for those feature modules. Uh, so we do not need to envision all the changes that we do later on because we can basically um, add new members to existing classes, to any existing class and also extend their methods. And in contrast to object orientation, we can not only do this, uh, but we do this to kind of the original class. And this class is then already used automatically in all the other parts. So we have direct feature traceability from a feature to its implementation in a feature module. But of course, there are also disadvantages. It requires the adoption of a language extension and composition tools. The small keyword original is not necessarily a problem. Of course, if you use a general Java compiler, it will complain about the original keyword, but it will also complain that you call some methods which are actually not defined. So it's a bit hard to develop uh, with this because you need some new tool support for this. You need new integrated development environment and tools that understand these language extensions. So these tools somehow need to be uh, created for every possible language. So it's not that like with preprocessing, we can apply the preprocessor to any um, to any textual file. But over here, we need to do some, at least some to some extent, um, uh, effort in order to make uh, the implementation feasible. Uh, so far, there are only academic tools um, built by us in terms of uh, feature IDE in terms of feature house ahead. There have been also versions earlier for feature C++ or for C++ code and so on. So there are some tools, but most of them are rather on an academic nature. So it's not something that is widely applied. Although there are some startups that are using 
something that is very close to those ideas of feature in the program. The granularity is restricted to method level. So uh, when it comes to more fine granular extensions, let's say I want to replace the third statement within a method, then I need to copy this whole method and we have this clone and own idea again, at least on the method level. Right? But we will see something uh, how aspect orientation improves at least on the last part. So the lessons learned on feature in the programming, mix and base inheritance, getting rid of the traditional limitations of inflexible inheritance hierarchies, because the inheritance hierarchies in terms of mixing are actually generated after I made my choice of features. So it supports encapsulation of cross-cutting concerns. To some extent, uh, we have feature traceability. I can find everything for a feature in the single folder and a single collaboration. But the encapsulation is actually uh, a tricky part still. So you can think about this again, how much encapsulation we have if every later feature can completely refine and completely replace existing implementations of other plugins. So this is not a strong encapsulation as we find this with components or plugins. So it's largely an academic approach and not widely applied in industry. And you can think of why is class refinement and how is it different from feature-oriented programming? It looks very similar. So what are similarities? What are differences? Uh, then it's interesting if you think of the decorator design pattern, it adds some additional functionality dynamically to existing classes and feature in the programming can be considered as the static counterpart, right? While the decorator pattern adds some dynamic behavior to existing classes, classes but not, does not change the static um, classes in terms of their methods that are available, feature on the programming uh, kind of can be seen as a static counterpart. You can think about this, but also how does feature on the programming violate classical principles of information hiding and encapsulation, and what are the consequences uh, in terms of modular development. Thanks for your time and hope to see you in the next part on aspect-oriented programming.